to record. All right, and we will begin. Um, so my name is Claire Ratcliffe Adams. I am an education associate at the Space Science Institute located in Boulder, Colorado. Um, and at the Space Science Institute, uh, that is where we run StarNet, the Star Library Network um, that I believe many of you are a part of. Um, but if not, and you want to learn more about how you can Im be involved with StarNet, uh, those links are on the link bank as well. Um, and I'm joined here with Dylan Connolly, and I'll pass it over to him to introduce himself. Hey everyone, uh, I'm Dylan Connolly. My pronouns are he or they. Uh, I am an education specialist at uh, the Space Science Institute, uh, and uh, I largely do the, the kind of STEM activity clearinghouse uh, support, create how-to videos and facilitation guides, as well as leading web webinars uh, for librarians just like you to get you excited about running STEAM programming at your library. And I'm real, real excited to share some of the stuff we put together for the We Are Water project with y'all today. Great. And we are also joined today by Beatrice Chavez. So she's working behind the scenes in the chat. Uh, so if you have any questions, uh, please drop those in the chat and she can help you out. And periodically, she'll be dropping the link bank in the chat. So that's where you can grab links to all of the resources we'll be referencing today. Um, and before I move on, just to give you all a chance to use the chat function, um, I have a question for you all. So the background of this image here of the slide um, is a water feature. And it looks like many of you are coming from the West um, where water scarcity is certainly an issue. Um, and I'm wondering if anyone recognizes this water uh, feature that we see in this image. If you think you know what it is, or you just wanna guess, uh, go ahead and add, put your answer in the chat and make sure you're addressing everyone instead of the default, that's just the panelists. Um, yeah, what? are we looking at here in the background of this slide? I will give you a hint. It is located in the Southwestern US. Uh, Joseph missed the question, so I'll pose it again. So on this slide, in the background, there is a water feature. Kind of looks maybe like a river, uh, some sort of water coming through. I'm wondering if anyone recognizes this image. Um, this was taken by NASA's uh, Landsat 8 back in 2014. Um, so this is an image from space. Uh, but yeah, does anyone have any guesses what we're looking at here in this picture? Well, guesses the Rio Grande. Dylan, earlier I asked him and he thought it was the Colorado River. Right, very good guess, Colorado River. So amazingly enough, this is actually not a river. This is an image of Lake Powell, uh, which is located on the border of Utah and Arizona near the Four Corners region of the US. Um, and back in about the early 2000s, Lake Powell was about over 90% full of, of capacity. Um, and this is a man-made reservoir that supplies water all over to Western states. Um, but in 2014, the Landsat 8 uh, took this picture and we can see here that it is less than 50% full. Um, so the Western US is going through an incredible drought. It has been for many, many years. Um, and this is part of why we decided um, to do this We Are Water project, which I'll be talking about a little bit later today. Um, but water is essential to life. It is essential for all of us, um, not just humans, plants and animals too. Um, and in regions where it is scarce, you know, we really have to work together as communities to try uh, to make sure we're utilizing this resource is in an equitable way. So we'll be talking a little bit about that today, uh, but that's kind of an introduction of how and why we started the We Are Water project. Um, now I'm gonna turn it over to Dylan for a fun icebreaker uh, and I'll turn it over to Dylan, yeah, take it away. All right, so I thought we would do an icebreaker all about 
you know, this, this whole project we are water and the, the stuff we're going to be talking about today is really focused on water in the four corners region. So I thought what we would do is maybe what water, what type of four corners water weather uh, are you today? So um, go ahead and throw your answer in the chat. Um, are you a dry thunderstorm full of energy, feeling really flashy? Uh, are you a drought? Are you like maybe waiting for some relief in need of some jurgens, you know, a little dry and cracked? Uh, are you a uh, flash flood? Are you fast acting and enriching to the environment? Um, or are you a winter storm? Are you cool, uh, in control? Uh, you know, snowpack in the Four Corners region is really, really essential to water health. So are you preparing for the future uh, right now by being a winter storm? Uh, go ahead and throw, uh, uh, or are you a completely different type of water, uh, uh, weather or future? Uh, go ahead and throw your answers in the chat and tell us why you're feeling that way today. For me, I have had uh, several cups of coffee. Uh, so I am feeling very much like a dry uh, thunderstorm. I might burst into electricity at any moment now, judging from the amount of caffeine uh, running through my system. I see Jenea is also feeling like a dry uh, <laughs> thunderstorm. Uh, Joseph and Claire both feeling uh, like droughts. All right, um, we'll be sure to get y'all some, some liquid refreshment here pretty soon. Um, Sandy's feeling like a flash flood. All right, I like that. Um, bringing those new, and Robin, Robin and Sandy bringing those nutrients uh, to the area with their flash flood, uh, hydrating that soil. Um, excellent. Uh, so on that same note, you know, now that we're kind of thinking about ourselves and our relationship with water, uh, how we're feeling, um, let's go ahead and start a, a discussion question. So this is just to kind of get everybody thinking about this. One of the things that um, is really essential in the Four Corners region uh, is uh, thinking about water as a resource, uh, not just, you know, something that occurs naturally, but something that um, is a resource that um, some people control, some people don't, uh, some people have more access to than others. Um, and is an essential for all life in the area. So I would love it if y'all in the chat uh, could describe a time when you realized uh, or thought of, kind of first came to you that water was a resource at, or that had different values or access for different uh, groups. Uh, I know when I was in high school and living in Southern California, uh, that was the first time I really remember there being restrictions on uh, lawns and what, and it really got me um, uh, watering your lawns and having restrictions on uh, how much water you can access based on uh, drought conditions. And that really made me realize, uh, you know, really think about what, how that water is allocated, you know, things like having a grass lawn, being a, in a desert area or in a desert canyon in Southern California, is that really like a good you know, way to distribute water when there are people who don't have as much access. So if y'all if y'all feel comfortable sharing, um, what is a time you thought um, uh, you realized or you encountered water as a a resource with different values or access to different people? Claire, while they're doing that, do you have a, a story you can share? I do. Um... Yeah, I got really into gardening in my 20s and I lived in Utah at the time and I was like, hey, I'm going to set up a water, like a rain catchment system to water my plants and found out that in Utah that was actually illegal, which was really surprising to me. I thought it would be a really great way to conserve water, um, but I guess the, the like thought process behind that or was that the rain is actually belongs to the people downstream of you. Um, and that if you capture that, you know, you're taking away from, from, you know, people in the watershed downstream. I think recently they have overturned that and it's now legal to do water catchment systems, but that would just blew my mind. I had never really thought of, of, of rain, you know, in that way. We're getting some really great answers here in the chat. We are. Emily shared a great story about uh, working in the Peruvian desert for the summer and that water was rationed per household. So you had limited cooking and no showers, which I can't imagine working in the desert all summer and not being able to take a shower afterwards. Um, you would have needed to like scrape me clean when I got home. Um, <laughs> that African drought in the 80s, the song, We Are the World. I mean, you know, I think that's one of those things maybe thought of as a camp classic now, but had a very, very serious message behind it and is an ongoing issue in Africa. Um, Joseph shared a story about the water pump uh, break in Colorado and uh, uh, they had no running water for a whole week. Um, 
Emily also in Michigan talking about the Flint water crisis and how differently uh, different communities, even in industrialized areas, and you know, we're talking a lot about, uh, you know, uh, natural areas like the Four Corners that have a lot of, you know, natural water stuff, but water access can be influenced by political decisions like in Flint. Um, you guys are sharing so many great stories. Uh, Kelly, you talked about learning what boil water advisories are, which is a, a big thing. If you don't have access to potable water, you have to boil it in order to even just drink, have a glass of water, the basic thing you need to keep your body going. Uh, Karen was stationed in Spain in the 90s in the middle of a multi-year drought. The city water was turned off during the day. Uh, all you could use would have been collected on the roof, which sounds absolutely crazy. Um, I started realizing the importance of water conservation with Sandy while I was teaching first and second grade, and we discussed how water we use today is the same water that's been on the earth since day one, and that we can make water. That's very true, Sandy. It's a, it's a, that's what the water cycle is all about, that uh, perpetuating of water from the ground to the sky into our bodies and back again. Uh, Alexis talked about living one winter with no winter with no running water. Really change your perspective. I bet that would, Alexis. Uh, and Karen said when our, our water source was deemed unsafe and we had to boil it and we went and brought it to the tank. So yeah, I mean, and that's one of these things where you know you can take, uh, especially living in an urban environment. I think you can just take it uh, for granted. You turn a faucet and potable drinkable water comes out. Um, but that's not true for everybody in every urban area and not everybody even has that kind of urban uh, city infrastructure um, uh, in there and might have to procure their own water from a well or catchments or things like that. Uh, Vicky said living in an area with oil pumping and being in a drought, we were about clean water for homes and agriculture not being used for fracking. That's very true is those kind of uh, energy extraction um, uh, things can be very, very damaging to the water table uh, and water. Thank you so much for sharing, everyone. Those are some great personal stories. And I think uh, a lot of these stories highlight really how important uh, water uh, conservation, water conservation education is. And hopefully we can get into a little bit of that with some of the activities and resources we're going to be showing off today. Now I'll turn this back over to Claire. All right. Yeah, thank you all for sharing. It's you know, this project has been really focused on the Four Corners region of the U.S., which if you don't know what I'm talking about when I say Four Corners, it's where uh, Utah, Colorado, Arizona, and New Mexico all touch corners together. Um, so there's a really unique spot in our country down there where water is really scarce and there's um, it's the access to it from different communities down there, including indigenous communities, Latinx communities, um, and, and, you know, ranchers and agriculturists. Um, it's not always the most equitable. Um, so, but it's great also hearing, you know, the, the issues that you all are facing from other parts of the country as well, you know, where fracking um, is a big thing or yeah, if your own water is unsafe to drink and you have to boil it, um, you know, we all have these intimate connections to water. Um, and at some point in our lives, you know, we all did realize like, wow, this isn't something I can just take for granted. Um, and that many people in the country have, have trouble accessing. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the We Are Water Project. Um, sorry, the slide's a little blurry, uh, but it's called We Are Water Connecting Communities um, because no matter who you are or where you're from, water is something that is important and it connects us all as human beings and as uh, uh, people uh, and organisms living on this planet. Um, so this project is using water to connect communities, um, to share stories like you all just did in this last discussion, um, and just connecting th through water ab about our sense of place and where we are experiencing our lives. Um, this is a project that is funded by the National Science Foundation. So just a shout out to our funders um, and kind of the big value statement behind this project is sharing stories and inspiring conversations about what water means to communities across the Four Corners region of the Southwestern US. Um, so this is specific, uh, we've, we do focus on the Four Corners, but the resources and activities that we'll be sharing with you today, we hope um, are applicable to anywhere in the US or anywhere really in the world for some of these. Um, so, you know, we're, we're focusing on this very amazing, unique region of the country, but hope that the, the ripples that go out from this project can also benefit your community. This is a big project. Um, it's not just StarNet that's on it. It is a collaboration between scientists, 
indigenous science educators, learning research, re researchers, informal educators, and library staff. Um, so up here, I have a list of our various partners on the project. I do wanna give a big shout out to the first box you see up here. This is Series Outreach and Education. They're part of CU Boulder. Um, and they've really been leading this project and developing so many of the great resources that are a part of the project, including the traveling exhibition, which is a part of We Are Water. Um, so they've really been leading the charge. Uh, but we're also joined by the Ind Indigenous Education Institute, Native Pathways, water, Western Water Assessment, and all of the state libraries of the Four Corners. Um, so it's been a really fun project with all of these great partners. Some of the goals that we have for patron experiences in the We Are Water project include um, participating in STEAM, that's science, technology, engineering, art, and math learning experiences. Uh, we hope that patrons will see water topics in new ways and increase their awareness that water is critical and scarce across the Four Corners region. We hope that patrons see themselves, their community, or culture reflected in STEAM learning experiences and are able to expand their cultural and or scientific perspectives about water and are able to appreciate multiple ways of knowing about water beyond just the Western viewpoints, you know, of, of the water cycle and, and all of that, but like going into uh, other deep connections to water that other cultures bring. And also, of course, uh, to engage in local water topics through sharing art, water stories, water concerns, and conversations. The We Are Water project comes with four traveling exhibition pieces. Uh, there is a big story wall where people can share their thoughts, artwork, um, and stories about their connections with water. Um, the second image here is a giant Connect Four piece that highlights the connections of the ecosystem and how we're connected through water. Um, so there are pieces uh, showing animals, showing plants, showing weather phenomena similar to our icebreaker today, um, and also the landscape that is shaped by water. This third piece here is a giant Plinko game um, where you get to act as a water management, uh, in a water management position. Um, and in years with drought, you have to make the decisions on who gets that water. It's very tough to make those decisions. Um, and then the last piece is an AR sand table that uses, um, uh, what is the word I'm at looking for? <laughs> uh, augmented reality, thank you. Uh, augmented reality um, and a sand table where you get to make your own landscapes and put your hand underneath the augmented reality projector and it rains water down and you can kind of build your own watersheds and see how we're connected through watersheds. So this is currently on, uh, on tour right now. It is at our first site in the Four Corners region in Aztec, New Mexico. So if you're around that area, definitely check out the Aztec Public Library. That's uh, who is housing this currently. And next it will be going to the Navajo Nation Library and Museum. After that, it will be in Bayfield, Colorado, if you're anywhere near there. Um, and then we're in the process of selecting our next host sites for 2023. In addition to the traveling exhibition, um, some of the learning resources that we've created include take and make kits, which we'll be highlighting two today that you can download for free um, and use at your library. Programming resources, such as the activities we'll be demonstrating, um, a curated activity list on StarNet's STEM activity clearinghouse, um, and some library facilitation guides that we've made just for public libraries. So that is the We Are Water project. Um, and now we are going to go into activity demonstrations. So I'm gonna turn it back over to Dylan uh, to talk about adaptations, a way of life. Um, I do see a question in the chat. So will the traveling exhibit only be available in the Four Corners area? That is the plan for right now. Um, since we made it specifically for this area, although many of the resources, all of those additional learning resources like the take and make kits um, and activities, those are all free for you to use. Um, and you can find those in the link bank that Beatrice has been dropping in the chat. Um, so those are things we would love for you to uh, take a look at and, and share with your patrons. 
So I will turn it over to Dylan for Adaptations, A Way of Life. All right, so Adaptations, A Way of Life is one of the um, Take and Make kits um, that we are uh, creating for uh, the uh, we Are Water Project. So it's actually a set of six activities that was originally designed by the Arizona Sonora Desert Museum. And what we've done is we've adapted it um, to reflect the Four Corners uh, region in the plant and animal species. Uh, so you can run either version, both are available on the clearinghouse. Um, and it's great, each of these six activities is great on their own or as part of a larger program, um, especially if you're maybe looking to explore some of the sci starter citizen science um, resources that we're gonna be talking about later. If you're like, interested in participating in one of those uh, water tracking citizen science programs, it's a great way to introduce some uh, science around that uh, before you dive into that. And we do have a fully in-depth uh, I'm not going to be going into a ton of detail about uh, how to run each one of these activities. Um, we do have a uh, fully uh, immersive uh, how-to video uh, and a full color facilitation guide available on the Clearinghouse entry for Adaptations A Way of Life, um, which is available in the link, uh, the link to which is available in the link bank that Beatrice is sharing. Uh, can we go on to the next slide? So as I said, each one of these activities and demonstrations explores different adaptations of desert plants and animals. Uh, so it's a really great way to introduce the concept of adaptation, um, which is a trait that a plant or animal has that helps them survive in their environment. Uh, some of the science that's included in this, we go over the concept of succulents. So those are plants that have a fleshy interior to their leaves and a waxy uh, exterior, uh, very often covered in spines or some sort of other protective material. So we're talking about plants like uh, prickly pears, uh, saguaro cactuses, um, aloe vera, those are all types of succulents. Uh, and so we have uh, demo, which uh, uses some green paper time. Well, I'll be going into all those in these in a minute. Um, but we also have some stuff about keeping cool in the hot desert, how plants and animals do that, as well as uh, shade and light and how that can affect how an animal uh, interacts with the desert. Concepts like uh, being nocturnal or um, how plants and animals adjust the, or plant, how plants adjust the angle of their leaves relative to the sun in order to control how much light and heat they're absorbing. Uh, and as I said, all these demos and activities can be done on their own or paired uh, with one or more of the others uh, to create a, a longer program uh, or to help give some context uh, or buy some time while one part is maybe drying or, or setting on one of those. Can we move on to the next slide? So the first uh, demonstration we have here is the succulents demo. It's really simple, just uses some green paper towels uh, or napkins and some wax paper. And this models how different parts of succulent leaves absorb and repel water. Uh, so you, the green paper towels um, act as an absorbent uh, material, kind of like the fleshy interior of succulent leaves that are designed to retain as much moisture as possible. And the waxy, uh, the wax paper models the waxy exterior of a succulent leaf. Uh, so you run this activity just by putting out these two different types of paper, uh, sprinkling some water on them, and then using some inquiry, you can uh, in ask your patrons to take guesses about how this might be having materials like this in their leaves. Uh, or outside their leaves might help plants survive in the desert environment. Uh, can we move on to the next one? And after you do that demo, this activity, the succulents activity, is a great way uh, so that your patrons, um, especially kids, can kind of see this uh, process in action. So it uses virtually the same uh, materials. You're just going to put these and tape these things to a whiteboard. Uh, so you're going to sprinkle that whiteboard with some water, cover one side with a uh, or a blackboard, excuse me, you could use a whiteboard if you wanted, whatever kind of sturdy material you can attach these to. Um, sprinkle some water on there, and cover one with a napkin, one with a piece of wax paper, and leave it to sit and evaporate. Um, while that's evaporating, it's a great time to do an activity like uh, the Build a Desert Creature art activity that's included, we'll be talking about a little later, uh, the prickly pear model also coming up, or if you just wanna simply do like a story time and do like a read along, uh, kind of activity while these are evaporating. Those are all great uh, to do that. And what you'll notice is when you set this, uh, these materials over the water and then come back later and absorb the, uh, observe, a lot of the water will have evaporated through the, um, the paper towel or napkin while a lot of the, almost all the water underneath the wax paper will be retained because the wax paper provides a hydrophobic barrier or a waterproof barrier so that the water can't evaporate versus the napkin being entirely observant, absorbent, all of that water can rise to the surface and evaporate off. Uh, so this is a really great demonstration to show how both parts are needed. You need to be able to retain water 
uh, as a succulent plant in the desert, but also be, keep it from evaporating from your leaves. You need some, uh, not only the capacity to hold and keep that water, but something that's gonna keep that water from evaporating when you're exposed to the hot desert sun. Move on to the next activity. And those adaptations are really, really greatly modeled through the prickly pear model activity. It uses virtually all the same activity uh, or materials. Uh, paper towels or napkins, uh, some of that wax paper, and then you're going to, uh, you using some crafting materials like scissors, tape, and some toothpicks, create your own model of uh, a prickly pear leaf. Um, so the patrons create their own model succulent, and this is really great because you can set this up as a station, a facilitated activity, or it also makes a fantastic take and make, because uh, all you need to do is maybe provide them uh, with the wax paper, uh, toothpicks, napkins, uh, and ask them to provide their own scissors, glue, or tape. Um, and I can actually show up if you want to spotlight me uh, for just a second, Claire. I built a couple of these models so I can show uh, you how they look like in person. The pictures are sometimes a little hard to scale. Uh, so here I have two different versions. This version I have uh, made with tape. Um, as you can see, that's, you can see the inside of these a little bit better. But if you don't have a ton of tape, if you have like glue sticks or something, you can also secure the edges of your prickly pear model leaves uh, with some glue. And then putting these uh, toothpicks through there to create the needles, you have a really nice prickly pear model. And you can ask your patrons as they participate in this activity, um, which parts, um, which adaptations might be used for what? What are the, what is that green fleshy napkin interior going to help you with? What is that waxy paper? And then why might they have needles, you know, to help prevent predation? Uh, now, these are the uh, bigger versions. If you wanted to get a little creative or maybe extend this uh, into a more in depth art project, you can also make prickly pear models of different sizes. Um, so, here I've made these instead of using the big, uh, 12 inch deli sheets. I've cut my wax paper into some smaller sizes to create some different size prickly pear models so I can attach them together and make like a whole plant. I've also attached, because this is a prickly pear, um, I had some, a collection of some random buttons. So I picked out some nice pinky purple ones to create some prickly pears that I glued um, right to the edge there uh, to create a prickly pear model, um, uh, the, to add the prickly pear fruit to the model in addition to just the leaves. Um, and from here, you can, if you have some small terracotta plots or even some solo cups, you could create like a faux plant, a fake planter with these, attach this to a uh, chopstick or a uh, popsicle stick, put that in some gravel or beads inside of a, a solo cup and create like a little faux prickly pear planter. There's a lot of different things you can do uh, with that activity. Uh, and can we go ahead and bring back those slides? So also included in, uh, oops, let's unspotlight me so everybody can see, there we go. Um, so we also have a couple of really fun kinesthetic uh, keeping cool demo demonstrations. So both of these are great ways to involve your patrons uh, and get them up and moving. If you're looking for an icebreaker, for example, or something like that, uh, these activities are really great. Uh, one we have is shade and leaf angle. Those are the top two images. We just take a simple flashlight, any source of light. Uh, you can even do this out. This is a great outdoor activity if you're doing other types of outdoor demonstrations, um, where you just ask your patron to angle their their palm directly towards the source of light and then away from the source of light, and ask how much of their hand is being covered by that light and how that might act. Uh, how a, a leaf um, on a desert plant might act the same way. Is it preferable to be always facing 100% of your leaf to the sun all the time? Or might you want to control, especially during super bright, super hot parts of the day, uh, so that less surface area of your leaf is uh, being exposed to light and therefore increasing things like water evaporation, heat, uh, et cetera. You can also show how evaporative cooling works. This is one of my favorite ones to do. Uh, you just ask a patron to hold their arm out and sprinkle some water on their arm and then have them flap it up and down. Uh, uh, and what that'll do is as that they're flapping up and down, some of that water is going to evaporate off their arm and you're going to feel a cooling effect. Uh, and lots of desert animals use evaporative cooling to stay cool. Uh, one of my favorites is uh, if you've ever seen footage of kangaroos in the outback, uh, you'll see them constantly licking their forearms over and over again. And what that does is that wets their forearms. And as that evaporates in the, um, uh, in the desert heat, that part of their body is cool and as they circulate blood through that part of their body it cools their blood uh, and cools the rest of their body down. Um, 
This is also how panting works if you have a pet dog. Um, dogs don't have sweat glands, so they have to release uh, some moisture through their tongues, which creates evaporative cooling and cools off their body. Uh, and then finally, we have the last activity included in the uh, Adaptation of the Way of Life activity suite uh, called Create Your Own Desert Feature. Um, and this one's really fun. It's a great wrap up or um, something to do while you're doing that evaporation uh, demonstration is you ask uh, your patrons to design their own desert creature. It's a really great synthesis of some of the other things you cover in this activity suite, adaptation, different types of adaptations um, for, uh, and stuff like that. And they can create their own adaptations for a desert creature. So here we have one uh, that was designed, uh, uh, that we designed as an example um, called the ringed, winged rabbitoid. Um, so it's got the body and legs of a rabbit that run at quick speeds. It's got a tortoise-like shell to protect it from getting hurt and protect it from predators. And then it also can fly. It's got wings like a falcon to reach uh, fast speeds when hunting for prey. So we've got a predatory rabbitoid here. Um, what's great about the adaptation of the Create Your Own Desert Creature activity is it's as easy as having a pen and paper to run. You can also do it with found materials, chenille stems, string, uh, and it's a really great um, clean out the craft cabinet activity um, for, uh, for asking uh, patrons to design their own creature with whatever materials you happen to have lying around. Uh, and that is, uh, are all the activities included in Adaptation Way of Life. And I really invite you to check out uh, that, that uh, the, uh, shout out to, yes, indeed, Beatrice for creating this adorable, adorable winged rabbit toy. Um, and uh, be sure to check out uh, the Adaptation Way of Life on the STEM Activity Clearinghouse, uh, where you can also find uh, our full color, immersive step-by-step -step, uh, facilitation guide, uh, and our, uh, our how-to video on how to run every aspect of this activity suite. And I'll turn it back over to Claire to talk about our precipitation towers activity. Thanks, Dylan. Yeah, so the next activity we'll be talking about is called Precipitation Towers. This is a NASA activity um, where participants create 3D graphs using stackable cubes, such as Legos, um, using actual NASA data. Um, so this activity allows them to observe and compare precipitation levels from several different locations, um, but you can make it place specific by creating a data set unique to your own location. So the activity guide uh, does come with instructions on how to use a database um, that NASA has created for your specific area. As long as you know your longitude and latitude, you can develop your unique data set. Um, this is a really great activity for tweens. Um, it even can be expanded to younger kids. Um, there's, a, there's a few ways to modify this activity uh, just with math skills. Um, so for your older, maybe tweens, even teens, uh, there's ways of reading the data um, and having multiple uh, places past the decimal point or talking about averaging numbers, getting the mean and medians of, of these data sets. Or you can leave off the more difficult math stuff um, and have it be a little bit more just of a tactile fun experience for younger patrons. So the activity guide includes precipitation data sets across the US um, and it also has uh, data sets from around the globe. And those are already generated, ready for you to go. If you don't wanna take the time to create your own data set, um, you can just start and have kids create graphs using the, uh, the, the data sets that already are provided. Um, there's also a 3D printer file to create bases for the precipitation towers. So if any of you have a maker space at your library and wanna start using those uh, or looking for ways to use your 3D printer, there is a file you can use. Um, and it also includes several videos about drought in the US. Um, and also for those of you living in areas maybe where drought isn't the concern, maybe sometimes it's too much water and flooding, um, there's also videos you can use about uh, uh, what happens if you have too much water. We are in the process of developing a a library facilitation guide. Um, so the original activity is meant for more formal education uh, settings, but we are creating a really quick kind of one page guide on how to do this activity. And we'll also be creating a how-to video. Um, so that will all be coming soon. So be sure to check out the, we are water resources in the link bank um, in just a, 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 later on in this year, if you are interested in getting the library guide and the how-to video. But it's a really great 
activity, my favorite part about this activity is you can do this anywhere. You know, you can really create your own place specific graphs on your own town and community that's really relevant. Um, so it's not just one of those one size fits all activities. You can make it very specific to your location. All right, and I'm gonna turn it back over to Dylan to talk about build a bug. All right, so similar to the des designing a desert creature uh, activity we were talking about from adaptation, a way of life, build a bug is all about learning about the adaptations of a, to a certain type of environment uh, and animals that have those adaptations and designing your own uh, based on your own creativity. Um, so patrons will learn about uh, adaptations while creating their own aquatic insect or other aquatic invertebrate. Um, and you can make this a great take and make by providing a printed copy of the table sign and some simple craft materials. It's a really, really great found materials activity um, that you can do. This another kind of clean out your craft cabinet. I'll be showing off a few examples of different ways you can run this activity with different materials in a bit. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the background science of build a bug. Um, and we'll move on to the next slide. So does anybody want to take a stab? Um, I think I mentioned maybe a definition earlier, but uh, does everybody, uh, anybody want to throw in the chat what an adaptation is? Uh, uh, what, is what do you think of when you think of the word adaptation? Give you a hint, there's a couple examples on screen right now of the black fly larva and the crane fly larva, of different adaptations they have. A change to student environment. Yeah, that's a really great definition, Vicki. Adjusting to survive in the environment. Yeah, it's all about fitness. It's all about how you interact with the environment that you live in. So if we look at these examples here, a black fly larva has a net on its head for collecting food. Uh, the crane fly larva has tiny hairs and suction cups along its body so it can hold onto rocks and hard substrates and flat flowing water. Um, and so those are both uh, different ways of like grasping at the environment, but they serve different uh, functions. So it's all about the, the way that this particular creature, the ecological niche that it, uh, it occupies. We'll move on to the next slide. So what are some adaptations an insect or macroinvertebrate might need in uh, to live in water? Um, so we have stone pull nymphs, the stone fly nymph, they have claws for capturing prey. They also have gills in its armpits for breathing dissolved oxygen in fast flowing streams. Very important if you're living in an aquatic environment. Uh, this mayfly nymph has hooks for holding on to tight substrates, as well as gills. Um, some other adaptations. Can anybody think of any other adaptations you might need if you're a uh, invertebrate living in an aquatic environment? Anyone? Bueller? All right. Um, I think we'll, uh, <laughs> so some other types of environments might be uh, just ways of moving around the a measure of buoyancy. That's a great one. Um, all sorts of different adaptations. If you don't have gills, some way of carrying oxygen with you, either creating a net of bubbles so you can breathe or having some sort of snorkel like siphon that lets you uh, breathe water from the surface are all important adaptations uh, for aquatic macroinvertebrates. We go to the next slide. So one thing is, uh, and we'll get into this as we're thinking about designing these creatures, is asking probing questions. Like, why would this particular creature need that adaptation? How did that adaptation help it survive uh, in its environment? And we go to the next slide. Camouflage so it doesn't get eaten. A great one, Claire. Uh, so in, insects uh, or invertebrates that live in water are called ma aquatic macroinvertebrates. So aquatic coming from living in water, macro meaning large or large enough to see without a uh, microscope, and invertebrate not having a backbone. We have a couple more examples here on screen. The water boatman, uh, which has these paddle-like legs for swimming in slow-moving water. Um, dragonfly nymphs have claws for capturing prey and climbing on emergent vegetation. So even inside one you know, freshwater environment, you might have a fast-moving stream uh, a slow pond, a, you know, different types of areas um, that different types of invertebrates uh, might occupy and might have different adaptations to help them survive. Move on to the next slide. So macroinvertebrate, um, aquatic macroinvertebrates are really, really good uh, kind of proverbial canary in the coal mine for water health. 
Um, if you, uh, because macroinvertebrates, even though you can see them without a telescope, are still relatively small, um, the uh, degree to which they're affected by pollution is greater than larger organisms. So um, they are also the base of many food chains um, for larger vertebrates uh, like fish, birds, uh, uh, and things like that. Uh, and so the, being on the base of a food chain, if they're not surviving, the rest of the food chain uh, doesn't survive. Um, and it's just, uh, and so they're really, really sensitive to biological, chemical, and environmental changes to water systems. Uh, so this is a really good um, way to demonstrate uh, overall ecological and environmental health in aquatic systems. So for this activity, we're going to be creating uh, your own special aquatic macroinvertebrate based on the environment you make up that's a, a freshwater environment. Um, so why don't we go ahead? So you're going to go ahead and find, use some found materials. Identify three adaptations that your macroinvertebrate has to help it live in water. Um, there is a guide in the activity guide that has a list of uh, many types of adaptations and some suggestions for materials you can build those with. Uh, and you use the art supplies to build your macroinvertebrate and give it a name. And if you will go ahead and spotlight me, Claire, I will go ahead and show you a couple examples of ones that I have made. So here's the first one I've made. This is kind of my twist on a water boatman. So I made this using some feathers, uh, some toothpicks, some googly eyes I had around, as well as some very tiny pony beads uh, and some modeling clay. So I made the body out of modeling clay. I gave it, ooh, as my googly eyes are falling out. Um, I made compound eyes uh, using uh, some googly eyes. I gave it some sharp teeth to capture its prey. And then I gave it, I decided the feathers could represent those kind of like paddle, like limbs that it would to propel itself through some small, uh, so the slow water. So it's got these almost like oar type limbs that it can use to move through the water. And because I didn't give it gills, I also gave it this net of air bubbles on the back, um, which uh, it can use not just for buoyancy, but also um, to uh, breathe as it can move some of those to its base uh, to, to absorb some of that oxygen. Um, so this is if you have some modeling clay, a bunch of good craft experiences. If you have some stuff that's maybe just donated, um, I've made this other version of an aquatic bug uh, out of mostly found objects. So I just coated um, a toilet paper roll um, with some green paper, made a little cone out of the excess paper that I didn't use to cover it. I had some buttons uh, to make its compound eyes, some chenille stems to give it some fuzzy legs, as hairy legs are a really great way to propel yourself through water. Um, and I gave it really sensitive antenna as it's probably, if it's in this environment and it's hunting for food um, and also might want to avoid being preyed on itself, uh, I need some really sensitive sensory organs. That's why I give those big, big antenna. Um, so you can see this is another way of creating some, uh, two very different ways of creating some cool crafty bugs for Build-A-Bugs. And if you don't have any craft supplies around or you may be looking to run this activity uh, with some older patrons, Teens and tweens very often will love maybe drawing their, their bug design instead of uh, using uh, some craft supplies. So that's also a low cost way to maybe, if you're looking to extend a program, you have some extra time. Uh, when you're doing some water related programming, uh, this is a great way just adding, having some pen, pencil, or paper. Um, I designed a, a, a different bug here. It's got fuzzy legs again, uses this big old net. I think I've decided it's made out of some spidery type silk. Uh, to capture some prey, got some gills, and then I had originally was going to make this a feeding uh, or a breathing tube, but it has gills, so I decided that these are very sensitive antennae that get to the surface to, uh, to sense for water vibrations so it can hunt for prey. Um, so those are all different ways you can run the Build-A-Bug activity. It's really nice and versatile like that, where it really just requires some grounding in the background science and then whatever materials you have on hand. Heck, you could even have your patrons describe these bugs to you uh, rather than creating something if you really, really wanted to. So it's a really nice versatile activity. It teaches a lot about water conservation and, and ecological health. And I hope you all have as much fun running it at your libraries as I did creating these examples for you. Awesome. Thank you, Dylan. All right. And thank you, Beatrice. Uh, she just dropped the link they could get in the chat as well as the certificate of attendance. So if anyone does have to jump off early, that certificate proves that you came to this training um, if you need that for your 
uh, professional development. Um, so I'm going to jump back into it with some citizen science projects all about water that have been developed by SciStarter, uh, which is a partner of NASA. Um, so this is a really great way to engage your patrons in collecting actual data that will be used by scientists um, for a variety of different topics and projects. Um, so if you go to SciStarter.org, that's on the link bank. Um, you can find a project really easily just by using the keyword function, um, or you can search by topic. Um, and if you want a little bit more of an advanced search that is, again, specific to your location, then click on Project Finder. And that will take you to this, where you can actually type in what topic you're interested in and enter your exact location. Um, so I went ahead and did a search for Aztec New Mexico, which is the first library that our uh, exhibit is at um, with the topic of water and 158 different options came up. So there are all kinds of projects that have been put forth um, by different communities and different scientists for you and your library to get involved with. Um, I do want to point out that they have been developing citizen science projects just for libraries, as well as trainings for you, um, if this is something you haven't done before. So if you click on libraries at the top of the homepage, that will take you to an area that talks all about how libraries can serve as community hubs for citizen science. Um, so in this page are all kinds of resources for becoming part of an online community, um, projects specifically for libraries to engage in, and all kinds of trainings as well. Um, so if you're just starting to dip your toes in the citizen science pool, um, check this out and learn how you can get involved with making a difference in the world and collecting real data that scientists can use. Um, we do have some additional re our water resources that we want to share. There's two new take and make kits that have been created by our partners over at CU Boulder. Um, these include be a water historian and a coloring and activity book. Um, so I'm gonna change my screen share to the We Are Water project page um, and just show you where you can download these files and start using these uh, awesome resources. So at wearewater.colorado.edu, you will find our project webpage. Um, you can learn all about how this project started um, and the different partners involved on the team. But over here, learn and engage. Um, we have activities, oh, sorry, take and make kits about water. This I know became really popular and really important during the pandemic. And even though we're kind of starting to shift out of the of shutdowns and, and turning back more into in-person programming, I have heard from a number of libraries that take and make kids are still very popular. So there's all kinds of stuff here you can check out and everything on this page is in English as well as Spanish. And we are in the process of translating many of these into Navajo as well. Um, but in previous webinars, we've discussed some of these take and make kids. So I'm just gonna talk about the two most recent ones. Down here, we have be a water historian. So I'll click on this first. So if you just click view resource, you can download this and print it out and just hand it out to your patrons. It's already ready to go. Um, but this is created for ages 13 and up. Um, and it, it is about how to collect stories. Um, so a big part of We Are Water is sharing stories and sharing everybody's uh, connections with water. So this is a way kids can interview people in their community to learn about how they're connected with water. So it goes through an uh, interview protocol that we've developed um, and kind of helps kids learn how to conduct interviews and how to record the interviews and how to share it. Um, so there's brainstorming worksheets um, and, and all kinds of resources. And I do want to point out there's really great, if you go on to more information, there are these note cards that were developed to help kids in their interview process. So it has uh, areas where they can write down their own warm-up questions um, and has prompts already for them if they're having trouble coming up with questions. So it helps them to ask, you know, what are your memories about water and areas where they can record that and really be a little water historian 
um, in this fun take and make kit. All right, so going back, uh, the other resource I want to point out is this, <laughs> the, well, there's two of them. Uh, the series graphic designer created a We Are Water coloring and activity book um, last year and had so much fun with it that she decided she wanted to create a second one. Um, so I'm going to just highlight the second activity book here. Um, but this is a beautiful thing. Again, you can print it out. Most of it is in black and white since it is a coloring book. Um, but it just shows beautiful images of the Four Corners region and the plants and animals that live there, as well as dot to dot activities, um, more coloring pages, there are mazes, um, matching games, uh, pictures of scientists, um, and just all kinds of ways for your younger patrons to have fun and learn a little bit about water while they do it. All right, so those are our. Uh, new Take and Make Kits from Series. And uh, our last resource, I know we're giving you a lot of resources, uh, but these are all really great, um, are the StarNet resources. So I'm going to turn it back over to Dylan to end out on our resources. Excellent. If you wouldn't mind spotlighting me so everybody can see what I'm showing off. All right. So, um, uh, a great, great resource for not just this, if you're looking for water activities, but for any sort of uh, STEAM activities is the STEM Activity Clearinghouse on StarNet webpage, the link for which is in the uh, link bank. Uh, we have many featured collect, we have over 500 uh, different uh, vetted STEAM activities on the STEM Activity Clearinghouse. Um, but I wanted to highlight a couple of different collections. There are these featured collections right here on the landing page. We have one for We Are Water, which is really, really fantastic. Um, which has uh, 28 different activities in there. Um, who lives in the water, who dirty the water. My favorite uh, that I wanted to talk about today is this really fantastic Waffle Gardens activity. Um, and the Waffle Gardens activity um, is a really great uh, kind of take and make style activity um, where it, it talks about all about raised beds uh, in, in a gardening and in indigenous style. Uh, so it's got step-by-step -step instructions, even has this really fantastic uh, technology extension uh, using micro bits. Um, so you can actually add sensors and stuff to this to, uh, uh, to, to um, create your garden even better. We also have, um, if you, as Claire mentioned earlier, I know many of you might be participating in the CSLP uh, Oceans of Possibility theme. We have the Our Blue Planet Earth collection as well which also features water and ocean based activities. We also have a toolkit for uh, the specific activities in here, um, which has activities like polar bear scopes with the flows, a uh, fantastic board game. Um, if you're interested in learning more about the We Are Water project or just getting some more advice on how to run STEAM programming at your library, we post all of the webinars we host on our webinars page, uh, starnetlibraries.org slash development slash webinars. Uh, and uh, the link to this will be here. This this um, webinar we're in right now. Uh, say hi to everybody uh, in this recording. Um, we also have uh, webinars about our blue planet Earth, citizen science, um, all sorts of different uh, things. Uh, the the J James Webb Space Telescope launch. We also have all of our past we are water webinars on here if you want to learn more about that project. And if you are new to STEAM programming or even if you just want to get some more facilitation tips, uh, we have this playlist uh, of uh, videos for STEAM strategies uh, for our NASA at My Library project. Uh, we're going to be adding, uh, I think, at least one or two more videos to this, I believe, right, Claire? But right now we have videos on how to be a good guide on the side, strategies for inclusion, um, virtual programming. If you are still a person, uh, if you're still doing, uh, if you're in a high risk area or you're high risk yourself and are doing virtual programming, as well as some great videos on addressing common space and earth science confusion. Uh, and so, yeah, be sure to check out all of those fantastic resources available from Starna, as well as all the ones we've talked about here today for We Are Water. Uh, and yeah, I think a, Claire's got a poll question to ask the, uh, all of our attendees, and I'll turn that back over to her. Great, thank you. So yeah, we just gave you a ton of resources to think about. Um, but we would love to hear which of those kind of resonated with you. So I'm going to launch this poll question for you to share with us uh, which of these activities and resources are you most excited about? 
So as a refresher, we went through adaptations, a way of life, precipitation towers, build a bug, the size starter, citizen science resources, and those take and make activities developed by series from CU Boulder. So I'll give you just a few more seconds to enter your choices and you can choose more than one. Uh, if you like all of them, you can definitely pick all of them. If you didn't like any of them, you can leave them all blank. Um, but we just love to see what types of resources are the most helpful for libraries. So I'll give it just about five more seconds. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you for answering. I'm gonna go ahead and share the results so we can all see. Um, so we've got a good spread here. Uh, thankfully, every single one was selected at least one time. Um, so that's really exciting for us to hear that we are helping to you know, uh, provide resources that help you out. But it does look like those take and make activities are the most popular. So I'm gonna pass that news on to Ceres. Um, they've done fantastic work with those and Definitely keep checking that uh, website because more are being developed. Um, and yeah, we, uh, we're so happy to see that uh, these, these will be useful for you all. So that is all we have for you today. Um, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us. The recording will be posted on the StarNet website in about 24 hours. Um, so feel free to share this with any of your colleagues that might find any of this useful. And yeah, Flo, I'm so glad I got to that you're here. I got to see Flo in person at the Aztec opening day celebration day. So it's always nice to see her virtually again. Um, yeah, we'll stay on for just another minute or so if anyone has any questions, but otherwise enjoy the rest of your day. Yeah, feel free to put questions in the chat, but it's been great sharing all this stuff with you and we hope you enjoy it as much as we like making it. Thank you so much, Vicki. Thank you, that's really appreciated. All right, not seeing any more questions. Uh, if anyone does have questions, both of our contact uh, information is listed on the link bank. And we'll see you at the next StarNet webinar. See you next time, y'all.